Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you were well rested. Uh, our next speaker is Des Anderson. He's going to have not so much of a technical talk as I understood, but it's still going to be a good one. So enjoy. <laughs> Cheers, Eva. Um, hey, everybody, I've got 30 minutes. I've got a lot to try and dive into, so I'll, I'll jump right in. There's the obligatory intros. Um, my dad's name is Des Anderson, uh, Vision Bats Anderson. Um, I guess just to call out, yes, I'm Sevsky Zed, Prita Malo. Sevsky Zivimov, the Beogradu, Ali. Nam the Zeman Neo Bagrad Neo Beogradu, Ali um some of the Kaj Mornam to preach English clean needs some preach some cow imam the way God in it. Um Dabro, Idemo. I can see my team getting panicked, so I'm gonna stop. Um so cool. I've got twenty-five years in tech and e-learning. I'm currently CTO and co-founder at LearnUpon. And LearnUpon is an LMS or a learning management system. So effectively we provide a platform. Um, that allows our customers to create, deliver, and track uh, training at scale. That's ultimately what we do. Now, there's lots of stuff in that. There is APIs and webhooks and Stripe and integrations and e-commerce and things, but at the core, uh, we're an e-learning platform. So lots of scale, lots of challenges, lots of fun stuff. Um, just very quickly, Learn Upon Globally, we're five offices across the world. We just hit our 10-year birthday this year. Um, and we are just about 300 luppers now in the team. So, um, so if, if you're a member of the team, you're a lupper. Um, so we're not little blue creatures. Nismo strumfovi, nismo to. Ali, um, we are blue blooded and we do help over 1,400 customers and 50 million users um, take training. And ultimately, that's 50 million courses all time um, and growing. So our tech hub is here in Serbia. Um, so this is where most of the engineering and the platform uh, delivery happens. So this is where the magic happens. So um, that's why I'm here. Um, apart from that, apart from living here, why am I here? I'm here to talk about scaling um, yourself and your platform. And you do those two things together. And there's lots of obvious stuff. There's technology, there's MySQL, there's Kafka, blah, 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 blah. Um, but there's lots of less obvious stuff um, that I've picked up over the last 10 years, uh, which are like subtle nuances that go on that will help you scale, um, ultimately that. Um, I do have a checklist at the end of this presentation, so I am going to waterboard you with a lot of stuff. So don't worry about taking it all down. I'll give you homework at the end, okay? So I'm here to talk about the obvious and the not so obvious especially. I believe in anchor stories. So anchor stories are things that bring you back to a certain situation, which I hope is today. So I want to provide you with an anchor. An anchor is a, is a way to um, solidify yourself in a certain situation. So when you're faced with a challenge, when you're faced with a certain thing, you can remember, oh yeah, that's how I react now, and that's how I'm going to solve this particular problem. So I'm going to talk about being Irish. I am Irish. And when I tell people I'm Irish, they're generally confused. They're like, are you drunk? Have you met leprechauns? Um, why are you not ginger? Um, Irish is this. So it's not um, orange hair. It's not pale skin that burns in a millisecond of sunshine or green jumpers or whatever. I'll let you in on a secret. You can spot an Irish person in a crowd from a million miles away. Okay? Irish people look like they've just been told two things. First thing is they've just won the lottery. They're millionaires. And the second thing is they have a minute to live. So there's just this look of shock, anxiety, fear, you name it, okay? That's what Irish people look like. So if you remember the anchor and you tie it up at the end of this presentation, you'll know what I mean, okay? So just remember this. I'm here to talk about three things, um, three, team empowerment, focus, and you, okay? And when you add the three of them together, that's how you scale a platform from zero to 15 million users and, and true. So it's stuff like team empowerment is how do you build your A-team? What are you looking for in personalities? How do you form your teams? What do you measure? What do you focus on? There's lots of noise, OK? So I'm going to share some of the signals that you need to focus on. And ultimately, you, how do you think about your career progression? What are the things that you can do um, to help yourself and your team and ultimately move your career along, OK? So first up, team empowerment. I think just take a look at this, and it all boils back to this, okay? There's lots of poets out there, um, particularly on CVs, and they can tell you all the things that are amazing and da 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 What you're looking for are drivers, not passengers. And passengers are the people that sit in the back of your bus on your team and join the journey at the window, okay? They drag the team down. So you don't want passengers, you want drivers. So it, as you scale through 15 million users, it's all about 
people, not just the technology. The technology plays a part, but if you have the right people in the team, you'll solve every problem. Because believe me, when you get to 3 million users and 4 and 5 and 6, you're going to have a different challenge. Every day is a new challenge, okay? But if you've got the right people in your team, everything's simple, everything's easy. So it all goes back to hiring. You've got to discover more. You've got to drill into CVs, okay? And um, ask the hard questions. You know, I love it like when you, you see someone has a bullet point and it's like I've scaled to this and this and this and AWS and Terraform and blah, blah, blah. And when you ask them, so like, what part did you play in the project? You know, and they, they managed the readme file or something. And, you know, like, I'm exaggerating, but you know what I mean? So you've got to drill in um, looking for your drivers. Um, balance personalities, I can't overstate this enough. So you want teams that have, call them what you want. So they're like, they're builders, they're fixers. There's, you got to have people that love process. You got to have people that just innovate. They're the ninjas or whatever you want to call them. And you've got to balance them out because they play into each other's weaknesses and strengths. Okay. If you have a team full of ninjas, you're going to have problems. If you've got a team full of um, fixers that love process, you're going to slow right down. So you've got to balance them. You do need to hire strong staff engineers, engineers, uh, but you do need graduates as well. And that all plays into the balance dynamic that goes in in your teams. Um, I'll talk a little bit later on about being senior. For me, graduates possess all the attributes of being senior. And unfortunately, we index on the things that they don't know. So stuff like the ORM that you're using, the framework that you're using, the technology. And unfortunately, that tends to um, dilute all the attributes that they have when they, when they join your company. It's really important. And finally, ideal team size. Um, there's lots of stuff out there when you read online. There's you know, the, pizza, the two pizza size teams in AWS. There's Spotify teams. Um, what do you need to ship? Okay, That's your team size. If you need more front-end engineers, put those in your team. If you need more back-end, whatever it might be. But you, whatever it is that you need to ship, this is really important. And then wrap it all around um, these other four points. Just a note on delivery. So when you talk about your teams, beware of the blurred lines. You got to get rid of your vagueness. Okay. So an exercise that you can do very simply yourself. So you go home this evening or on the weekend, take 15 minutes, take a piece of paper and write down what you think you're responsible for and what you're accountable for. Right. It's really that simple. Then get your team to do the same thing and come together and discuss it. Because I guarantee you, you're going to have blurred lines. You're going to have people saying, well, I thought you were responsible for that. And it's like, no, that's my job and you should be doing this. And then you realize nobody is responsible for something. Okay. And those, that's the vagueness that so you want to get rid of that. And if you did an exercise, believe me, it will be very empowering for you um, and, and for your team. So how do you empower your team? So you have all your personalities and you have your fixes and your doers and you remove the vagueness. Um, You've got to focus on these three things and you'll spot a pattern, right? It's all about three. The automated tests, you've got to start early um, and index on that. Like I would say in Learn Upon over the years, we've dipped in and out of this. And it's one of the things I regret as a founder and building a platform. We didn't focus enough on automation and automating all the things and everything from back end tests to TDD and so on and so forth. Now, that's a natural journey for a company scaling. You have to deliver feature to get revenue to build your company and so on, and the cycle continues. Um, so we're, we're better at that now. We're now more focused on automation, and, and it's making things a lot more clear. Um, coding patterns, pick one, stick to it. That's your code style. That's, that removes the vagueness again. It makes things more predictable. Um, again, I'm not saying that we're perfect in Learn Upon. We're still learning. Um, and we want to get better at defining this stuff. Um, but this is really powerful. It just it means that your team members can jump between different teams and they know what to expect because the other team is working in the same style. So it's that simple. And then finally, monoliths and services. This, <laughs> so I, I'm laughing because it's such a common thing. There's a lot of people think services serve or solve all the problems and you've got to do microservices when you're at 15 million users and so on. It's not true. Um, Monoliths are awesome if you can modularize them. And what I mean by that is, is, is creating um, well-defined APIs between your code. Okay? And again, that's about predictability. Um, again, Learn Fun's not perfect. And I know the team will agree with me. We have spaghetti in some of our code. And that's a natural thing of having scaled um, and grown the way that we have. Um, so what we're doing is we're modularizing our monolith and we're also pulling stuff out of the monolith that's not scaling. And we're making services out of those. But we'll only do it 
when we really need to. Services are a thing that can solve a problem, but they don't solve all the problems. You have to have balance. You have to, you, you have, to have both. So you've done all that. You have your services. Everything's cool. Everything's good in the hood. This one absolutely kills you. And it's a cultural thing. It's what if we fail? OK, this is a common question. It's awesome. If you fail, it's brilliant because it's really powerful and you learn something. It's that simple. So in your teams, and this is something you can do starting today, tomorrow, you can praise your risk takers, okay? Um, and especially intelligent risk takers. And I'm not talking about intelligent people that take risks. I'm talking about intelligent risks that you take, okay? Um, that's extremely powerful. So if you can encourage people to try new things, it's okay if you fail, learn from it and address it and retro and come back again. That's really, really powerful, okay? So what do you focus on? Let's do a time check. What do you focus on? Um, three things, your customer, um, your technology, um, and scalability. Okay, these are the three things that you want to zone in. And I'm, I'm not saying that there's um, not anything else. Of course there is, but these are the things that you need to focus on. So when I talk about customer, 100% um, happy is a myth. So don't try and design for that. What you want to do is design for your customer around 80% and 20% of your tripwire. 20% of your customers that are engaging with you, giving you feedback, pushing you, looking for more value, changing the features that you're delivering. If you're constantly designing for 100% happy, you're missing an opportunity, okay? Um, you're not going to scale. You're not going to grow. Um, so this is super important. Um, your customer doesn't care as a result for your well-designed for loop, right? So don't over-engineer. Um, just, just don't do it. It's going to hold you back. You're going to be using your energy on things that don't necessarily matter. Now, of course, if you change your for loop from five lines of code to three lines of code and your app is more stable for it, then absolutely do that, okay? Scalability, uptime, that comes top, top door. Okay, that's really important. If your app is not online or it's not fast, then your customers aren't going to be happy either. Okay, so that is important. But don't over-engineer. Don't overthink. It goes back to um, designing for 80% happy in your customers. You know, that allows you to get features out quickly, get your feedback going. It helps you move fast, add value for customers. Okay. When I think then about technology, which is the second thing to focus on, I think about these things. So first off, do I need to build everything? So like when we started Learn Upon, um, I distinctly remember I hated all the authorization libraries and the frameworks that are out there. I wanted to build a best one and it would be super cool and I could spend months doing that. But we'd, again, it's back to you'd miss the opportunity. What's the point in that? It's not going to bring value to your customers. The customer isn't going to care that I developed the best authorization library in the world, right? So. Find out what you need to build now, what are the, and then what are the things you don't need, okay? Don't index on those, and um, that stuff can come later. Which kind of feeds into SOS, or shiny, ob shiny object syndrome. Um, I'm an engineer, I love new stuff. I absolutely love new APIs and the smell of the documentation that comes with it and everything, the new features and da 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 But you gotta find the technology that's proven in production. So it's out there a year, it's in the wild, it's well supported, and da, 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 before you make your decisions. Um, I think all that feeds into then is starting small and deploying often. Okay, the two of them go hand in hand. Um, you got to find the minimal viable thing um, that you can deploy out for your customers that they can use or that will help your platform be more scalable. Um, it's all back to that. If you spend too much time over engineering and developing things, you're ultimately missing an opportunity to learn. Um, and deliver value to customer, which is obviously important. Um, but it is a journey, okay? And you have to buckle up um, and, and enjoy the journey um, as you scale through from 1 million to 15 million users and beyond. Because I know when we get to 16 million users, it's going to be a different challenge. There's going to be a new thing that's broken, and you've got to try and get the energy into that and, and go along with it, you know? So as, the sooner that you accept that and stuff is not predictable, and all that kind of thing, you're, you're going to have an easier kind of ride um, as you go along. Tech death, simply that, absolutely kills you. And again, I would say that, you know, in Learn Upon, we're, we're learning the hard way in certain things uh, where we haven't indexed on tech debt because we have been trying to grow. Um, but certainly as we're scaling now, 
um, this, is, this is a big focus for us and how do we update and change our libraries and things like that. I think tech debt is generally misunderstood. Like for me, um, tech debt is stuff like that you can't easily change. It's code maybe that doesn't have tests. It's maybe a good way of thinking about it, but it's stuff that you can't really change. Like if it's a old library that's been sitting there for the last 10 years and it works and it's scalable and there's no problems with it, then it's not tech debt. You leave it alone. It's perfectly fine. Okay, so you've got to really understand what's technical debt for you and your team, and then focus on that. Um, add it into your backlog of things that you do, um, and that will help you separate the noise. So come up with a definition for tech debt, and then start working on it, um, I guess is the point. So that feeds into timing your tech choices at the right time, and knowing how to reverse them. And basically what I mean by that is, is that when you're making technical decisions and direction, um, take five to ten minutes just to understand what it would look like if you need to reverse it. So back to my example, like if we had it at the start, um, introduced a, a third-party authorization library, what would it look like in three years' time if we had to pull that entity up? What would be the, the cost? What would be the time effort that we'd need to put in? So that's what I mean by that. Um, and continue pruning your garden, which is back to my previous point about tech debt. You have to continually look at that. And I know we all know that, okay? Um, and it's easier said than done. Um, but if you're continually doing things in small iterations and in small ways, brick by brick, that's how you scale. Because if you're trying to think about fixing all the things at the same time, you're going to stagnate and you won't go anywhere, okay? And the best way to do this stuff is just start, make a decision um, on what you want to focus on. So scalability, um, time check, cool. Um, so scalability, um, what is it for you? So like a, this, it's kind of similar to what I mentioned about technical debt. Um, scalability can really send you down garden paths and have you chasing ghosts, okay? Um, you got to understand what it is for you first before you start tackling problems. So is it response times? Is it availability even if the platform is slow? Like for example, I don't mind if I log into Netflix and it takes a little bit longer, but so long as the movie that I'm watching is not buffering and constantly jittery, okay? So I would imagine in Netflix, they index on jittery buffering and they don't really care about the login speed, okay? So you've got to index on in everything. If you're trying to make everything super cool and super fast, again, you're not going to scale yourself. Your teams are going to get bogged down in too many things um, and ultimately everything slows down and backs up. So it can be everything from bug resolution time, CICD time, um, the time that it takes you to hire, it can be anything. There's lots of metrics, but you gotta decide what's important for you. And once you do, um, you gotta look at your breaking points. So the first breaking point that you have is yourself. Um, how far can you take um, the thing that you're indexing on? So if it's say, for example, response times, um, are you able to solve it? Do you have the skill set? Or not and that's your first breaking point because if you can't you got to hire or maybe upskill but you got to understand that and, and um, be honest with yourself about it and then as you go along and um, assuming it's let's say response time and you go from 1 million requests to 2 million requests or whatever and um, don't overbuild like you got to understand what your use case is and um, you know don't try and build for 50 million requests when your customers are only kind of probably going to take over about five right there's no point in delivering for 50. Um, I, I guess, like, I mean, I do like I'm a pandemic hit. I do remember, say, for example, Slack did a lot of good posts on this where um, their platform didn't miss a beat, okay? And it's because they knew their breaking points and they engineered for their use case plus 30%, okay? So that's what you need to do. If your breaking point in your platform is 3 million requests, then bill for four or bill for three, whatever, 0.5, whatever you think the metric is. So at least you have a bit of buffer room um, in case your platform does spike for whatever reason as regards usage. And finally, then I would type back to the others. And this is my other way of saying is understanding your own uh, breaking points. You have to scale through others. You have to do that with your team. Um, you can't be the lone ranger and trying to figure out all the stuff yourself. You're just going to burn out. Um, you can't do that. You know, that, that again is another um, attribute of not scaling and not helping yourself. So that applies to your team. Um, and each of you then can help each other scale through some of this stuff, okay? I think the cheat sheet is this, um, and this is what you measure, and there's lots of noise, and there's lots of signals, but if you're not measuring these, then I would say, yeah, you should start measuring these. So it's lead time. How long does it take you to get from idea to production, okay? 
um, and then along the way, what's blocking you up? And you, you index and focus on that, and you try and, um, and, try and remove that. Um, second thing is issues. So this is all in the realm of quality. So um, how many issues are you introducing when you, when you deploy? And then how long does it take you to fix those issues? Okay, that's super important as regards scale and moving fast and accelerating. And then finally, deploy frequency. So, I mean, it, it's quite obvious, but how often can you deploy? Um, and that feeds into the time that it takes to fix issues and, and lead time as well. Um, but it is an indicator that you need to be looking at. You know, we, like we've got competitors that can only deploy every quarter. There's 24 hour downtime. That's not something that we aspire to. You know, like in Learn Upon, we deploy every day. Um, and we're not perfect, by the way. I'm not saying no company is but we're learning and we're trying to make things better. And this is the type of thing that we're, that we're measuring and, and this is the stuff that we hold ourselves accountable to. And then finally, um, just to talk about you, um, this to me is the most important part and this is where the hidden art stuff goes on. Um, and I think it's the real subtleties that go on in teams um, and especially you as individuals as you're trying to scale your career uh, work on these technical challenges or platforms. I don't mean to dismiss technology. Um, of course, there's scaling problems at MySQL and certain tables can't expand certain number of million in rows and da-da-da-da. That's the same with every single technology. It doesn't matter. What you've got to do is just focus on these types of attributes, okay? So if you grow slower than your company, you're going to become redundant. It's that simple. Um, like learn upon as we've scaled over the last 10 years, honestly, it feels like 20 different companies to me. Um, literally every six months, the company changes and we're now coming into another set of six months where I can see the company change and that's a natural evolution. But if you don't have the energy for that and you're not adaptable, you'll quickly become redundant. Your company will surpass you and pass you egg. Okay. So you've got to embrace the change and um, you've got to be the driver on the bus that I'm talking about. And the same applies for your app, okay? Um, so that's why I don't want to dismiss the technology in this. This for me was a game changer. Embrace the nerd in you. Um, I'm, I could be just speaking for myself, but I would safe to say 80% of us here are nerds, okay? Um, I think you're not in a way. So when I realized this, it was like, yes, I am a nerd, and there's certain ways that I operate, okay? And, he, and you need human interaction. You can't lock yourself away in a cave um, and just ignore people. You do need to find opportunities in your company to pre present, to co present to your teams and stuff. Um, I don't enjoy what I'm doing standing right here now, but I am, it is a bit of fun. I'll be quite happy when I'm home tonight in the PlayStation shooting, shooting zombies, right? I like my alone time. So you do need that, like noise and humans make you tired. Um, you got to realize that, like when you go home in the evening, I don't know whether your old CC is nodding, when you go home in the evening, you're exhausted and it's because of humans, right? They're just bringing you down, but you need to balance it. You do need to balance it. Okay. Um, there's a technical writer, Michael Lopp, who writes a great book called Managing Humans. Um, and he describes humans as he's a technical writer. I think he's VP in Slack now, but he describes humans as uh, random snowflakes. And I think it's like such a perfect um, sort of analogy of what we're like, you know. So a as engineers, we need to deal with people and we need to recognize that yeah, everybody is different and they're just gonna sap energy out of you, okay? As Soon as you realize this, you can index on trying to find your alone time. Believe me, your world will be a better place, 100%. Being senior, um, so I mentioned earlier, like graduates possess these three things when they come out of university and they're entering your company. And if, you, if, you're, if you're doing internships and you're bringing graduates in, index on these three things and explore it, because believe me, this is to me is what being senior is. The first thing is um, providing options. I love it when an engineer comes to me and says, you know, Des, I've been looking at this problem. I've got three possible solutions. I think option B is the one we should do, and here's the pros and cons and the trade-offs. That's being senior, okay? Um, technology you can learn, absolutely. You can go and Google it, you can take a course, you can read a book, you can ask your peers, you can get coaching. You can't teach someone to learn that, okay? And when you come out of college, naivety is a wonderful thing because that's naivety. It's your open-mindedness. And if you can explore that with your teams and encourage people to do that, believe me, that's where magic happens, okay? Believe me. The elephants in the room for me is learning. Now, 
don't get me wrong, you learn a lot on the job. You're going to learn from your teams. You're going to learn from your mistakes. Your company will have training and learn upon. We're, we're, we're learning company. Um, we use our own product for training. We've LinkedIn learning. Um, that's all part of it. 70% of your learning happens outside of work. Okay, And again, for me, um, that's just another one of those things you just have to accept. And the reason is that you're passionate about something and you're free to choose. And when you're passionate about something, you take it in 100% better and you learn it 100% better. So that's why that's important. So if you are an engineer and you've side projects and I've talked to people who have automated how they water their plants at home, that's awesome. That's where the magic happens. And you can bring that learnings into uh, your team and help your team grow and all that kind of good stuff. That's where, that's where really you push yourself ahead as a senior. And then finally, avoid being a know-it-all. Um, and other companies call these other things like the intolerable, intolerable a-hole uh, that nobody likes on the team. Don't be that type. Be the type of person that when someone comes to you with a problem, coach them. Don't tell them the solution. Ask them some questions. Coach them into the solution. Because believe me, as people get sort of um, comfortable with that and they start recognizing you as individuals that they can go to, um, it becomes like, oh, every time I go to Mila, she has like, I, I don't know, I just come up with a solution every time. That's really powerful. And that's how you start becoming that senior um, across your teams. Okay, so be the coach. Don't be the know-it-all. Don't be the teller. Be the person to ask questions and try and collaborate and figure out stuff with your team members. Um, in relation to being senior then, um, and um, sort of like embracing your nerd, fire yourself often, okay? I can't overstate this enough. Every six months, do this, okay? Um, you're going to stagnate if you don't, and you're going to become that person that's in the team that honestly managers and leaders don't want to move, okay? And they'll be saying, again, like, pick on me, I should pick, I don't know, Andrea, Alexander, whatever. If you say, let's move them out of the team, let's promote, no, 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 they know all the stuff, leave them there, the team will fall apart, okay? You don't want to be that person because you're going to get stuck. So what you want to do is, is make yourself useless. Because when you do, you've got an opportunity to make yourself useful again. So that means you've given all the knowledge to your team. They're perfectly capable of running by themselves. And then you get to focus and you get to learn new stuff all the time. You never get bored. I often hear engineers saying, I'm bored, you know, fire yourself, you know, go learn new things and seek out opportunities. Be energetic about it, you know. Um, you become a leader naturally, and then of course, whether or not you want it, promos beckon because ultimately you start getting recognized as the coach, the person that's constantly giving away their Legos and letting the rest of the team play with their Legos, and you're, you're moving on to new things. So innovating at scale, um, I guess I can just sum it up as this very quickly. Don't overthink things. Focus on rapid experimentation. I was saying that earlier on, you've got to focus on smaller things, delivering value, um, take intelligent risks and um, praise the intelligent risk takers and make that a culture in your team. Okay. Make it a culture that you're able to fail and make mistakes and do it all with a sense of urgency. And that's how you scale from zero up towards 15 million and true and beyond. If you have a team like this, that's just constantly moving and pushing each other giving away their Legos, coaching each other and things like that. That's where the energy happens because the technology is the easy part. That's super simple. You're all clever people. You all have the skills to code and solve technical problems. You can go on Stack Overflow. You can find the solution. These are the things that will hold you back if you're not, if you're not focused on. So back to the anchor story of remembering Irish people, right? So they look like they've just become millionaires and they have a minute to live. Um, that's the constant battle as you're scaling. You're constantly faced with the, the sort of the two impossible things, okay? And the simple thing is, is you just decide. It's really that simple. And that's how you move forward. That's how you don't stagnate, okay? It's simple as that, okay? Technology is easy. That's not easy, you know? So I'm done. Um, I would say thanks a million for listening. I'm just up on time. Um, I am outside, so if anybody does have any questions, I'd love to talk to you more if you've got any questions, and certainly feel free to contact the Learn Upon team. I'm happy to chat. I did mention earlier on, that's your homework. 
so you can take a photo of that. I guarantee if you do those 10 things with your team, you'll be better for it, okay? And if you're not, find me on LinkedIn and come and tell me why. I'd love to understand. Thanks a million, okay?